Hey, hey, all right. In our last video, we uh, were going to jump into a quick refresher on how the three statements are actually going to link together in our particular model. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got the income statement first. We've got the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. These are the three statements, and they link together like this. Don't freak out. It looks complicated, but once we go through the exercise of peeling back each of these connections, everything will make a lot more sense. So the way we're going to build up to this ultimate level of understanding so that it sticks with you in your gut is to first model out the templates for each of the three statements without any complexity. Then, as we begin to fill in details and build in Excel logic into our three statements, we'll start to layer in key supporting schedules along with their assumptions that will in turn finish out the Excel logic for our core three statements. And along the way, there will also be an interesting circularity issue that we're going to run into and we'll explain exactly how that works and what you should do about it. And we'll show you the right way to think about that and how to solve it. So more on that later. Eventually, we want to get to a solid gut level understanding of this, how all this works, how the three statements and the supporting schedules drive each other and link together, and how the economic intuition behind them really works. Okay? Now, in order to get there, we're going to use a modular approach. What that means is we'll focus building out the core statements, the income statement, the cash flow statement, the balance sheet, then all of our supporting schedules, like our working capital schedule, our depreciation and amortization schedules, our debt and interest schedule, and others, uh, which is uh, where we're actually going to be doing all of the quote-unquote dirty work of calculating our reasonable and defensible projections. These supporting schedules are going to serve as the conduit of data passed between our three core financial statements. In other words, we're going to make calculations and projections in our supporting schedules and then export the results back into our core statements. That's how we're going to link them to our core statements, which means that in our income statement, cash flow statement, and balance sheet, all of our projections we make in those core statements are actually just going to be referenced in directly from these you know, six or several supporting schedules. Now, if all this sounds a little bit abstract right now, don't worry. It will all become uh, much clearer soon. Uh, okay, cool. A few last tips before we begin and jump right in. First, we're going to spend some time filling in historical financial data from, uh, for our example company. The goal of this is not to audit past financial data. It's to project future performance because historical results can sometimes be very difficult to reconcile. So that's not our goal. We're not going to be trying, trying to reconcile uh, any perceived discrepancies in, in the historical statements. The real reason we spend time analyzing historicals, uh, historical performance at all, is to provide a guide or reference point for making future projections. Second, there is no right answer in defining our projections and assumptions reasonable minds can disagree on what the future may look like. So the goal here uh, really is to make projections and assumptions that are quote-unquote reasonable and defensible. Not just to plug and chug a 10% growth rate here or there because that's what your business textbooks do in their examples for teaching financial modeling, but rather to actually think critically about what's going on in the company's operations. What are the forces that are shaping uh, its strategy and performance, and therefore what are reasonable and defensible future projections of that performance. Third, we want to make sure we're modeling in a way that's easy for another analyst to open up the model and pretty quickly be able to understand what's going on, how the model's structured, and what are the logical drivers of it. A bad model is hard to follow and confusing to audit. A good model is easy to follow, easy to audit, easy to see what its core assumptions are, and leaves a clear trail of its calculation logic, and it doesn't pack and combine overly complex formulas into the cells. A good transparent model prefers to break up complex calculations into multiple, easy to follow steps, even if that means showing the full buildup of steps that lead to your final answer. Okay, with all that said and done, 
let's start building and we're going to start that right in uh, right when we get to the next video so stick around